Uh, I'm just going to touch on a few themes today, really, and it's really the main uh, the main theme I'm, I'm going to be discussing is the notion of cultural transformation of the built environment, how things go from being despised to revered, and uh, the kind of tactics that we can use to achieve that. Um, these two images are of two versions of ideal cities from the 15th century, um, Alberti and uh, Carnavale. Now the interesting thing about these uh, paintings is they show cities of collections of idealised built objects. So um, you can see pieces of Roman architecture in there, pieces of um, late Gothic, uh, early Renaissance palaces. But the point is that there's a, a kind of uh, celebration of the architectural object that lifts it above purely being mundane provision of function. Um, and the other point is that the, the city is, uh, does have diversity of style. Um, and in relation to uh, this city, I think it's important that diversity is maintained. And in a way, we're standing inside this building which celebrates uh, kind of optimism in terms of dealing with a form of transport that could be seen as very quotidian and banal. Um, and also provides the opportunity to do things for which the building was not originally designed, but it could be like that. Okay. What is a city gate? Um, I think it's interesting today that this, this project is called Gate 81. Are there 81 city gates to Preston? Um, it's clear that in the uh, 18th century there was a very, very explicit and uh, defined view of what a city gate was. Um, and we can actually perhaps revisit this as a kind of moment of uh, a kind of celebratory thing. Uh, when Boulay drew his version of what a city gate could be, there is evidence of pride within uh, the kind of civic body. Um, and there's a clear notion that you're actually moving from one condition outside to another condition inside uh, the urban body. Um, scale is important. So cities need very big things to actually be serious about being a city, I think. Uh, because it is possible to boil any program down to a level of kind of banality where it ceases to exist when it's, no, when, when it's not in use. And the question we have to ask ourselves as architects and urbanists is, is that an objective that is sensible? And is, is that actually an objective within the kind of wider urban scope of creating a place which people want to be at? Okay, bringing it home a bit. Uh, I was having a think, because I'm not from Preston, I'll be upfront about that. I'm from London. But when you view the city, what things do you think of? What symbols are there within the built fabric that mean stuff to people both within the city and without the city? Um, there are three things that I've clearly focused on. Uh, there's the Church of St. Walburg, the tallest spire in England. That's pretty significant. And it does a version of 14th century Gothic, which is um, pretty full on. Um, the Harris Art Gallery, which does a version of Renaissance Palace, which again is pretty full on. Um, and what this demonstrates is that the city is about acquiring otherness in terms of the big kind of cultural moves that are made. So how do you represent the ambition of your place? You import the best of other places to reinforce it. So here we are. <coughs> um, so what does the bus station represent? It's a kind of importation of a small part of Brasilia. Well, I haven't shown the slide of Brasilia, but I, I imagine you know what it looks like. You've all seen postcards. Um, it's a kind of 
Corbus distillation and Corbusian vision. It's an important signifier for the mid period of the 20th century when uh, things like transport were celebrated. And in a way, we're moving into a new condition where certainly the train has, uh, has become a, a celebrated um, kind of mode, mode of transport. Um, and as we move past uh, peak fuel, increasingly bus travel will be, will be seen again as significantly important. There was a fantastic programme on the telly a few, a few weeks ago about the golden age of Sharabank trips, um, where coaches are all styled to look like high-speed aircraft. Why not? Um, there is, a, there is a, pur a purpose of life, I think, to be uh, celebratory as well as uh, kind of banal. Okay, we'll move on to a few other examples of celebratory architecture. Uh, this is Oxford Road Station, Manchester's very own version of the Sydney Opera House. Kind of smaller and more useful because you can catch trains at it. Um, and if you don't like opera, which I don't, it's even better. Um, okay. Move on, come on. Right. What to do with things that are useless? We're faced with a choice, I think, or cities are faced with a choice. This is the Albert Dock in Liverpool. Uh, Jesse Hartley built it in the mid 19th century. Um, famous for having a wrought, plate wrought iron roof, so when it was bombed by the Luftwaffe in World War II, the bombs bounced off the roof. That is hard. <laughs> uh, it was designed as warehousing uh, in the days when everything was carried in sacks and in uh, small crates. Now, it fell into a, a period of disuse from the 60s till the mid 80s, and the whole thing was, the whole of the Liverpool docks were actually threatened with demolition. Um, the important thing that happened here was a recognition that this architecture has value beyond its initial function. Um, and when uh, Tate Liverpool located here in the, in the late 80s, it signified a transformation of the value of this architecture as cultural space as well as functional space. Um, and this was despite the fact that things like the you know, floor to ceiling lights too low, uh, the plans too deep to have adequate daylight and so on and so on, because you can overcome those small functional issues with decent architecture. And this is where architecture can actually step into the breach and deliver something about value within the urban space. And uh, now it's you know, one of the most visited sites in the UK. Oops. Okay. So, it's a clicker. Okay, why well, have I put Rome Termini in here? Um, because it's long and stripy. Right. There are two really good transport buildings in, in Europe which are long and stripy, and this is one of them. <laughs> I think that's important. The other one is in Rome. Okay. Um, Buildings you know, which have a kind of confidence and the ability to celebrate things that are about movement are necessary. And this goes back to the question about the city gate. Uh, how, do you, how do you represent the notion of uh, entering somewhere? Okay, transformations. Uh, on the left, is uh, Bankside Power Station. Now, I did my thesis project on Bankside Power Station. It was interesting at that point in the mid-80s. Uh, it was the largest building in central London, but nobody knew where it was, right? It's half a mile away from St Paul's Cathedral. But if you are somewhere, and I, I did a survey of you know, residents of Lambeth and other places, where is Bankside Power Station? I don't know, is normally the answer. Now, it was uh, decommissioned in the, in the 80s and lay dormant for 10 years and there were plans to demolish it. Um, it's, it's fantastic the Gilbert Scott building and uh, you know, better than Battersea really. Um, and when the competition was launched to reconfigure it as Tate Modern, 
uh, Hillsock and Mural did their scheme. I guess virtually everybody here possibly has been to Tate Modern, or at least knows, knows that Tate Modern exists. Okay, which is interesting because it's one of the most visited buildings now in the world. Um, how has it achieved that? Well, it, it's achieved it by not doing very much, actually, in terms of modifications to the fabric. So the turbine hall now doesn't have any turbines in it, but it's still called the turbine hall. Uh, and the surrounding uh, spaces have just been reconfigured uh, fairly lightly as gallery space. But the point I'm making here is that through the raising and transformation of the cultural profile of a built artifact, um, we can actually radically reposition uh, areas of the, of, the, of the city. And the interesting thing about Tate Modern is now triggered uh, the redevelopment of the borough in the area immediately adjacent to it. Come on. Okay. Big things made of concrete. We're, we're sitting inside a big thing made of concrete. Um, back to the 80s again. Uh, in, from the mid 19th century to the uh, mid 1970s, uh, Paris's meat market was located in, in La Villette, um, on the outskirts of Paris. Uh, okay, the, the, the building at the top of, that, of the plan on, on the left uh, was the new abattoir that was finished in 1969. It's a giant concrete uh, construction. Uh, not dissimilar in scale to this building. Uh, and it was ready, ready for the new mode of meat production to start in the 1960s. It started. Within five years it had closed because refriger refrigeration in lorries had become commonplace and you didn't need an abattoir situated you know, four miles from the outside, uh, from the centre of Paris. It fell into disuse. What are you going to do with this huge site? Um, which uh, uh, you know, was characterised by blood, really. Uh, and the cultural transformation programme came with the, with the Love at Park, which Shumi did in the, uh, the mid-80s, and the redefinition of the uh, abattoir building as a museum, museum of science and industry. And there are kind of clear uh, similarities in formal terms between what happened there and uh, you know, the redefinition of a large concrete building designed for something else into a new function. <coughs> and the opportunity, I think, that exists within Western Bus Station is to look at the expansion of programme that could occur within this space. One of my favourite activities, I'm rather sad about this, one of my favourite activities when I visit a new city is to drive to the topmost floor of any multi-storey car park. There's always no one there. You get a really, it's like a moment of solitude amongst the chaos. Unfortunately, there's a gate that stops you getting right to the top. And I believe friends of mine who, who did the uh, 20th Century Society um, tour there were reported by local office workers who thought they were going to jump. Right. Well, they made it to the top floor, but the, the notion of a kind of different kind of space that can exist in the cities in Port is very ancient. Okay. Uh, we'll just run through a few examples of transformations. Uh, this is St Pancras Station by Scott, with the St Pancras Shed by Barlow. Uh, done in the mid 19th century. Um, the front is a kind of neo Gothic 14th century style chateau meeting the largest span, uh, single span structure in the world at the time. Um, and in the 1960s, there was a plan to uh, drop the hotel for a road widening scheme on Euston Road to reveal the shed in its true glory. That didn't happen. <laughs> you could say. 
Um, of course, there, there's a kind of latency in this. You know, there's, a, there's, a, there's an ability that you can say, well, actually, architecture doesn't have to be fully active for its entire life. There are periods, ebbs and flows in its, in its occupation and use. Um, and so Pancras, certainly for a large <coughs> period of the mid 20th century, was an underused station. Um, King's Cross was far busier, Euston was far busier, so Pancras was this thing in the middle. Now, with the, with the, with the introduction, I'll oh, come on. With the introduction of um, Eurostar, uh, <coughs> the latent capacity of this infrastructure is something realised again. Everybody thinks it's the most fantastic thing since sliced bread. Gothic architecture has gone from being a bête noire to being marvellous. Why is this? Because the people who wanted to demol demolish it have all died. <laughs> you always try and destroy the things of your, your parents or your grandparents. It's a natural tendency. It's kind of teenager rebellion. But you know, you get to the point where you can do it. Luckily, they've all died. So, so uh, Anno Domini can actually help us here. Okay. Come on. Okay, so now we're faced with you know, the Eurostar terminal, which is fantastic. Uh, it is the cutting edge of transport, placed inside this 19th century structure, redefined uh, through the, you know, kind of appropriate insertion of new bits of kit. Uh, so there is, there is a necessity, I think, for cities to have latency built into them. If you always build for the absolute minimum, you end up with a uh, space that is at best banal, at worst, uh, just nasty. Okay. Uh, the uh, the conversation over how to deal with kind of contemporary conditions in architecture is 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 ongoing. And this is a competition entry that uh, I was involved with a few years ago, uh, looking at Robin and Gardens by the Smithsons. Um, we propose the radical transformation by moving in five miles to a better size, but, uh, which obviously was the correct answer, but hasn't been done. Uh, but, but, but what is interesting is the kind of battle, really, that surrounds the future of this structure. Um, because do you measure architecture purely on its running cost? If that is the basis of, you know, then we would be demolishing a lot more stuff, you know. Um, but sometimes it's better just to hold on and uh, invent a better use. Um, I'm not naturally a conservationist, I just like to hold my hand up here. However, some things are good and you have to recognise things. I think we're standing inside one of them now. Okay, right. Uh, we'll just run into a couple of uh, schemes. So, um, car parks. I'm a big fan of car parks. Too much, too much detail sometimes. Um, this is uh, Archidium's project from 19, um, uh, 1970, North City, uh, which looks at the redefinition of the car park as. Uh, a space for doing virtually anything you wanted to at all. Actually. Um, so the notion of the kind of transformative surface is important. Um, here we are standing, you know, sitting in some of the most iconic car parks, well, the bus station in the world, um, and it's necessary to realise the value of that culturally within the profile of a city like Preston. And within the UK, actually. Okay. So I'll just run through a quick scheme <coughs> that we did about 10 years ago now, um, looking at how you transform a car park into a university. Might be a you know, tip for you, Clan, here, yeah, but just, I'll put it out there anyway. Um, okay, come on. Uh, 
uh, I'll just run through this very quickly. Uh, <coughs> the great thing about car parks is they have depth. Um, and they have uh, 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 enough structure to do things. Um, this scheme really looked at the possibility of taking the multi-storey car park and uh, working through it Sorry about this example. Um, working through it to produce a kind of folded in car park and university. So you move up through the building, uh, so the ground floor Larry's car park, you then slot in layers of university. Sorry. Can someone just do it manually? Yeah, just do it manually. I apologise for this irritating. Yeah, there you go. Right. Um, okay. So, so, so the, there's a notion here of a kind of fluid and shared surface that is uh, kind of clearly appropriate to this building. The opportunity to actually redefine the program for the upper layers of this building is, is latent and evident. As part, of my, as part of my visit here today, I drove to the uppermost level. I was the only car there. There's no capacity, perhaps, although I don't know what it's like during the week, uh, but there's no capacity. And overcapacity breeds opportunity. Um, and this, proved, you know, this scheme was done to prove the possibility of actually engaging various types of program into uh, you know, a kind of ubiquitous um, yet heroic built form of the you know, late 20th and early 21st century, ending up on the roof of the kind of small farm. Okay? I won't go into, won't go into detail, but the point, the point of that project was to explore transformations and latency within the urban condition. Um, we're now at a point with this building, I think, where we can start to do that, really test it. Uh, the building is a cultural artefact as much as a functional artefact, and that is important. There's a heroic character and a celebratory character um, to this building, which raises it above just somewhere to get on the bus. Uh, and that's something to, to recognise and celebrate. Um, Preston has got the best bus station in the UK, there is no question about it. Does it want to get rid of it? That's a question to ask. You know, it's a peculiar ambition, if that is the case. Right. Sorry. Right. Uh, if you'd just like to get that last slide, no, the penultimate slide, okay. So, just going back, um, I see a kind of clear line of connection between um, the kind of heroic and celebratory architecture of the 18th century, the work of Boulay, the work of Boudou, and the heroic and celebratory architecture of this building. Um, the opportunity to actually celebrate uh, kind of human functions that are necessary um, and raise them above kind of quotidian and banal levels is imperative. Um, and as such, the move to kind of uh, continue and support and defend this building is something which we're absolutely on with, you know, in terms of coming from another city in Lancashire. Um, we're right behind this. So I'd like to just thank you for being here today. Thanks for putting up with me and kind of fighting away from these slides. Um, and I'll now pass over. So thank you.